All right, everybody. I just got done with my podcast interview with Hamid, and I got to I gotta tell you what. I know I say this a lot, but the information that we went over in this podcast will absolutely change the way that you think, not just about plant medicine, ayahuasca, you know, psilocybin, microdosing, but just how we kind of approach life from a, a mineral standpoint, from a stress standpoint, and how that kind of plays into how we're treated as as humans in, in this in this earthly experience. So I am so excited for you to listen to this podcast. I hope that you get a ton of information from this and and find him. He's the mineral shaman on Instagram, themineralshaman.com. I'll put all that stuff in the show notes and and find him wherever he is because he is a wealth of knowledge and he's thirsty for more knowledge. So again, thank you so much, Shamid, for being on. I'm so excited to release this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so welcome to another episode of the Doc Jock Show. I have Hamid Jabara over here, and we're going to be talking about really the pitfalls in, in my opinion, I think in his opinion as well, to you know plant medicine and people doing ceremonies with others. And there's a lot of educational background behind this that I know that Hamid knows. But Hamid, tell me a little bit about yourself, where you came from, where you are today, and that way everybody knows. Yeah, so... My journey is kind of long and I don't want to go uh, bore everyone to tears. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I started my, my early life sort of curious about everything. And I ended up in music school, studying music. And from there, I got really fearful about being a musician and making a living. So I went and became an attorney, a uh, very stable job. Always on the side, I was doing other passions such as meditation, yoga. I was always reading about health and alternative healing methods and things like that. I never thought I would make a lifestyle out of it. But after maybe five years of practicing law, I really felt the call to dive more into that work. And I started teaching yoga, meditation. I started studying more traditional healing methods. So spending a lot of time in Thailand working with old medicine, they call it. So body work and energy work, and yeah. herbal medicine. And, you know, teaching people how to work with their consciousness with sound and working through anxiety, depression, PTSD, using just sound meditation, yoga. It was through that world that I got introduced to plant medicines. And now, nowadays, when you say plant medicines, most people know what I'm talking about. But back then, I would say plant medicines, and people thought you were talking about tinctures, you know, that yeah. you're yeah. under your tongue. <laughs> But plant medicines, usually what we're talking about are those that come from the Amazon rainforest, like ayahuasca, or plant medicines from other parts of Peru, like wachuma, or some people think of peyote, which is more well known in North America, sort of the psychedelic plant medicine world. And so I've been in that world now for quite a few years. And um, I also on the side, you know, for during that time was doing health coaching. I've been diving deep for the last year and a half into sort of minerals and the way that the body works on a mitochondrial basis. And so it's sort of, everything's getting all mishmashed together and I'm starting to make connections between things that I don't think have been discussed. And so I've been starting to speak about a few things that I've noticed and trying to start dialogues and conversations about ways that these practices could be better supported and some of the things that people should probably be aware of if they're going to enter that world. Yeah, and and that's one of the things we were talking about before we hit record here is that when Megan, my wife, reached out and she was talking back and forth with you and then just your knowledge of like health and stuff, like what kind of nutrition is he talking about? And then you talked about nutrition, like that's like, I, I, that's you're speaking my language. So like I got really excited about that because when people talk about the plant medicine or they're going to travel to Mexico to go do an ayahuasca journey. And then you hear that like, there's no prep work. You just show up and you just got off of a plane and you jump right into a ceremony and 
things can go wrong. <laughs> and yeah. when it comes to minerals, I mean, that's another thing where I think you were talking about a stress component to the ayahuasca during these two, if, if people are interested in doing that, that it's something that you have to be aware of, right? Yeah, I, w- I would say that it's something that people should be prepared for. And, and the preparations that are usually given to people are sort of counterproductive. And a lot of the traditions don't know anything about diet. They don't know anything about minerals. They don't know anything about hormones. These are indigenous traditions that have been using these plant medicines for thousands of years in their culture. But in their culture, they don't have things that we have. They don't have depression. They don't have anxiety. Their metabolic health is completely different. And you see it in their bodies and sort of in the way that they show their mineral health. Like for instance, people of the jungle that I was with, I saw 90 year old men that didn't have a single gray hair, you know, (laughs) a full head of hair. And it's very unusual there to see that. And here in our culture, you know, I'm, I started getting gray hairs when I was in my twenties. Nobody told me that, you know, the, the common thing was that stress, but they never told me that stress burns through your minerals, your minerals, then sort of affect your mitochondrial health. You get all kinds of problems. So gray hair is a sign that something deeper is going on. Doesn't mean we're going to die, but it's something that we have different than them. And so a lot of the dietary preparations that these traditions have are not good for Westerners. I've seen things happen with people that could easily have been prevented. And so the way that I have always approached advising people that want to work with these plants is to consider that you're different. Don't just take what they're telling you, you know, to be gospel. And a lot of the dietary preparations involve things like letting go of salt for extended periods of time. And this seems like a good idea for them, but for us, you know, we're adrenally burnt out and you start to get rid of salt and potassium. Your adrenals get really scared. Your, your body goes into a stress response and, you know, you start to just burn through minerals really fast. And this can lead to a cascade of events that aren't related to the medicines. The medicines themselves are fairly safe. It's more just related to how people prepared and then went through the process. So we could get into more specifics, but I think that the main overarching thing that I've been trying to raise awareness around is that we have to as Westerners, if we're going to approach these indigenous traditions, we have to take into account where we are, our health, and we have to approach it with a different mindset, not just following the dogma that's been promulgated through people that actually don't know anything about diet or health. Anyway. Yeah. And I, I think that's a big flaw in our, in our health system just already is that we treat everybody the same. And if one thing worked for one person, then it's going to work for the next person. And that's not true. It couldn't be further from the truth because we all have our own bio individuality to us. And some people are more stressed. Some people do burn through minerals quicker. Some people are supplemented to try to support the minerals that they know are being burnt. So I'm curious from your experience, what type of minerals are you typically seeing? Cause I, I have some on the top of my head, but what minerals are you typically seeing being burnt out with a lot of people, especially in Western culture? The first mineral to leave the body that I notice is magnesium because magnesium is burned when we're under stress. My teacher, his name is Morley Robbins. He's kind of a mineral guru. He talks about something called the magnesium burn rate. So when we're under stress, we're releasing cortisol, other stress hormones, and we're essentially peeing out our magnesium. And then along with that, we're getting rid of all our potassium and our sodium. And so all of this is like a seesaw effect where the adrenals start to shrink and our magnesium leaves. The cascade is really big. Magnesium is at least responsible for 600 or more reactions and probably 3,300 proteins in our body utilize magnesium in some way. So it's not insignificant. One of the big things that ends up happening to people with long-term magnesium loss that I've seen and what we see in our mineral community is iron dysregulation because magnesium sort of works with the red blood cells to make them mushy so that they can get into the tight junctions. And if we don't have the proper magnesium in our red blood cells, they don't last very long. They, they sort of die early. Then our red blood cells have to get recycled and the iron recycling system can kind of get backed up. 
And so you end up getting deposits of iron in various places that aren't so healthy. And it kind of creates a cascade that is hard to unwind. And one of the biggest things, like I mentioned, that magnesium goes when we're under stress, but Westerners are stress cadets. I mean, they're there's not a day that goes by in most people's lives that they're not exposed to stress. And stress is often we think of it like work or home pressure, family, but stress is also physical, you know, like in our bodies, toxic stress, you know, and then we have the mental and emotional stress, but there's just so many things that are burning through our magnesium. So the one thing that, that if I had to pick a mineral that everybody needs more of, it's magnesium. But, you know, there's more to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I agree with you. And I don't think you could have said it better, stress cadets. It's the first time I've heard that. But it, it hits the nail on the head. I mean, Americans were, were, were trained to be stressed, performance stress at a very, very young age. And then that just perpetuates itself as a cycle every single day. And if we can't find things that stress us out, a lot of people will find different things or, or be stressed out about not having stress waiting for the next stress to come. And right. it's like, just stop the cycle. But you brought up the sodium potassium side of things. So you got the sodium potassium pump. So if you're burning through your magnesium, your adrenals are suffering, your sodium potassium pump is going to be off. So you're not going to be able to manufacture ATP, which is your body's natural energy. And so you're going to have more of that chronic fatigue type state take place. And then it is a vicious cycle where your adrenals have to work harder to try to produce more cortisol to get more energy. And then your DHEA drops and then you're not able to recover. It's bad. <laughs> it, it is bad. I, I have seen, I think our adrenals, they're supposed to be a, you're a doctor. So, you know, they're supposed to be actually of a fairly significant size. And <laughs> Most people's have shrunk to the size of like pinheads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, they can't handle it. And I, I know I was listening to, I forget who I was listening to, but there's a quote, I think from the fifties and I, I'm going to butcher the quote, but it was something along the lines of like, we weren't designed to take on the stress of every single person in the world. And so that means, you know, back in the fifties, forties, fifties, et cetera, we didn't have social media and like all of the, like everybody else's problems being passed on to us and whether we like it or not to me your conscious mind's passing this information off to your subconscious mind you see it as harmless but then you absorb the stress of somebody else's life and then you go to the next page and then you have more and then you have more and i think that's probably why the adrenals are suffering more than they ever have and it's so important to really understand yes you can supplement in magnesium and stuff and it, it, it'll help but if you still have the mental stress, if you still have the physical stress, the stress, the toxicity, the infections, you know, that's going to cause that stress response to continue to yeah. take place. Right. Mm -hmm. And we, we talk about, we call them the four horsemen. We've got inflammation is kind of the start of everything. Then we, in my opinion, so inflammation, then we have catabolic physiology where our body starts breaking itself down. Then we usually lead into some insulin resistance, and then it leads into that oxidative stress or oxidative damage in the body. And so we have to stop this cycle. And some people that I know try to go towards plant medicine. They're like, I'm stressed out. I just need to go do this, or I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. I'm so stressed out about this. Maybe I should go do an ayahuasca journey. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts? Like if somebody came and was asking your advice, if they should go to a ceremony with somebody, how would you, how would you approach that? I think what the, the, it's a fascinating thing that we're, we're in this go, 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 go. Okay. I need to go do an ayahuasca ceremony to cure <laughs> me. It's become triage. Honestly, it's, yeah. it's sort of these ceremonies have turned into triage emergency rooms for people that don't have any other way of slowing down. I see people get benefit. I have seen the opposite too. I've seen it be very destabilizing. One of the things that destabilizes people, if they enter in a very depleted state, if they're already adrenally burnt out and they're already have no magnesium, the medicine isn't going to put minerals in. It's going to further deplete them and they may feel good and they may have some benefit in as far as like addressing the traumas that they're they're trying to address but usually three four weeks later when sort of the monoamine oxidase part of the medicine wears off which is this part that keeps your 
mood elevated than they're worse than before. So I'm much more into gentle healing practices for people that are super stressed out. I think that one of the issues is just this quick fix. <laughs> give me a pill, give me a drink, fix my traumas that I've been holding on to my whole life. Fix my, in, in three nights of ceremony, I want to resolve everything. <laughs> you know, and it's, <laughs> I think it's part of the problem is approaching it that way. The way that I prefer to approach them is as really slow healing modalities. Sort of think of it like a yoga practice. You want to go to a yoga studio and do the handstand on the first day. Well, at least if you're me, you're not. <laughs> you're going to take a few years to ease your way in. And you're going to really prepare for that. And you're going to make sure that you're in good shape. And that's the way that I think that these practices with plant medicines, ayahuasca should be approached is to really prepare for it. Make sure that your body is healthy, that you've eliminated as much stress as you can, because we do have control of aspects of our life. I mean, it takes a little bit of willpower to do that. And then enter that process in, in a state that isn't so depleted and you're not going at hundred miles per hour already. You've already slowed yourself down. And then it can be a really healing process, I think. So I like to just tell people, you know, and it, I think a lot of it does come down to dietary stuff and making sure that people are really nourishing themselves. There's a real desire for a lot of people to just cleanse, cleanse, cleanse in our culture. <laughs> yeah. And they're forgetting to put things back in. <laughs> yep. Yep, they are. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you gotta I, nourish. You gotta nourish. <laughs> it's, it's it's like you have to de-educate somebody before you can educate them on on these things. Cause a lot of it is is 20, 30, 40, 50 years of this indoctrination of like we don't take care of ourselves until there's a problem. If there is a problem, then we take a pill. If that doesn't work, we take another pill. And then eventually you come to these crossroads and you're like, well, this isn't working for me or I don't want to do this anymore. And so then people will jump and jump ship and try something in this realm. And I work with a lot of like fertility cases and, you know, people will come to me and they've got, you know, six, seven different infections in their gut. And like, I want to get pregnant. I'm like, Whoa, hold on. We got to prep your body first. We've got to really, you know, slowly go into this, make sure that your body is replenished. Make sure your digestion works because that's the other thing. With our nutrition, our food sources are depleted of a lot of the key minerals that we used to have, you know, 50 years ago or so. And so what I find a lot of the times is with that chronic stress response, and I don't know if you know this or not, but it will suppress your stomach acid concentration. And so you'll lead into hypochlorhydria or achlorhydria where you won't break your food down. So even if you are eating the healthiest organic broad spectrum phytonutrients galore diet. If, you're, if your digestive tract can't break it down, it just turns into expensive urine or expensive stool. Yeah. And so it's like this huge encompassing picture of you can't just treat, you know, one area of the body. When you have stress, yes, your adrenals are under attack, but what else is? You know, you're going to be eating your digestive tract. You're going to turn into a cannibal, release glutamine, or you'll eat your muscle tissue and do the same thing. So it's really interesting how you approach these things. And so my curiosity then would be, and I'm going completely off the notes that I originally had because this conversation's great because <laughs> I have a path in mind. But if somebody was like, hey, Hamid, I wanted to start this healing journey. Do you have any advice? Where should I start? Should I start with yoga, breath work, sound healing? What direction should you go? And then is there like foundational support and then you know you you graduated from step one now let's go to step two is there something like that that you would suggest or recommend well absolutely if somebody has not done anything in the self-healing world the last place to go is ayahuasca this <laughs> is not a, a first step what i usually tell people is if you have difficulty sitting for five minutes by yourself with no distraction you're not going to like these plant medicines yeah, you're not going to be able to handle it because what they do is they put you into a state where everything is present and there's no way out of that. So I usually encourage people to practice yoga, meditation, anything that involves mindfulness first, just to become aware of what it's like to witness your thoughts and your feelings and your body. That's a good first step. That's sort of on the 
the spiritual level, I guess, or the level of consciousness. Because like I said, I've seen it, but if people go and they've never sat with themselves, they're going to have a difficult time. <laughs> it's really good. I mean, it's lifted. It's like you can't you can't put the veil down. The medicine is in you now, so you have to face those those demons. Yes. And exactly, and it's a lot harder than meditation. Is so that's <laughs> say, you can't sit on the couch for five minutes. Okay, yeah. it's not, you're going to be four hours sitting and staring <laughs> at all parts of yourself. I don't know. Yeah, you want to rethink this, and so I do talk a lot more people out of it than I talk into it. Yeah. It's not but, to scare but, them. It's just out of yeah. awareness that what they're getting themselves into. Well, you're not ready yet. And, you know, if somebody's come to you for advice, it's it's your advice. So you don't want to be like, oh, you're totally fine. And then they go and they have a horrible experience. They come back to you and you're like, you said I would be fine. It's not just to make everybody happy. You're not just agreeable. You're, you're educational. You're like, nope, you're not quite ready yet. Let's start here. And then eventually, you know, you could go to that level if you want to. Yeah. I'm a big fan of things that also don't mess with our biology, you know, sort of like uh, saunas, infrared sauna, cold plunge. Yeah. You mentioned breath work. Breath work, some of it to me is actually pretty intense. Yes, that might not be a first step for people <laughs> either. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there's practices here in Arizona, sweat lodges, other types of ceremonial practices that can really give people a sense of discomfort. Mm -hmm. but in maybe a safer way that they can start to push against, you know, psychologists have a term for it. It's called distress tolerance. Okay. So in the psychological world, they give the example, like you come home from work, you're very busy. Your mind is still racing. The second you walk into a quiet house, it doesn't feel right. So what do people do? They have uh, coping strategies. They may go eat or something, or maybe they turn on the TV. They want to listen to something. And, the opposite of that would be building up distress tolerance. It sounds hard, but really all they're saying is just, no, just don't do anything. Be with that discomfort for a while. That can be one of the most healing things that anybody does is just to stop what they're doing, you know, take time during their day and just be with whatever it is. Just sit there, not look at your phone for a minute, not look at the screen. Yeah. I think it's it's getting to the point where we have to train ourselves in that because it's really easy to lose sight of the fact that I think, you know, even 10 years ago, I was not staring at a screen nearly as much as I am today. I remember when I got my first iPad, I, I even thought, because I took it into the bathroom and I thought, this is <laughs> my life. Because do you remember before what you would read in the bathrooms, like Dr. Bronner's soap, and mm -hmm. you'd read like the bottles. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I, I agree. Yeah. I did the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Now it's like you don't even have a ability to escape because everything is so portable. And our consciousness is really getting hijacked in ways that I, I think we have to really guard against. Yeah. So I encourage people to do things like journaling, meditation, walking, hiking. Those are good kind of activities to prepare for ceremony and then really nourishing the body. It's not a time to go on a diet unless it's prescribed in some way by a sure. practitioner for a specific reason. It's really a time to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and nourishing yourself because most of the medicines themselves are cleansing. They're purgatives and they, they do cause you to imagine getting like 10 coffee enemas in one night. I mean, that's a big stress on the system. <laughs> Yeah. Need to be prepared for that because if you're not, you're just going to excrete all of your minerals and good stuff too. Yeah. So people need to be aware that these medicines will clean you out and you, you have to have some strength. Don't walk you in. You have to have deep. some strength and some reserve. You know, you, you don't want to walk in depleted. Otherwise your tank's already empty. You know, it's like starting a road trip with a, an eighth of a tank of gas. Good luck. You're not going to make it very far. Yeah, you know? exactly. When you were talking about the phones too, I remember something that Steve Jobs said before he passed is that even his kids, like he wouldn't let them have iPads until they're like 16, 17 years old. And everyone thought they were crazy or he was crazy. And he probably was a little bit, but he was a genius. But it, it, the reason was, is because he knew what these things were capable of. And there's a lot of research that people will use that as a coping mechanism and it's, it's a dopamine fix. So every yeah. time you're scrolling on there, boom, dopamine, 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 and dopamine is released just like it is if you do, you know, cocaine, same type of stimulant type happens. And so if you put your phone down, 
Like I challenge people to put their phones down just for the night. Like that's a part of my nightly routine is I lose my phone. I don't know where it is. Or I put it on the charger and that's that. And people struggle so hard with that because they're so ingrained in picking it up and scrolling. And that dopamine release, the thing that you're watching is another form of a stress response. And it's a, a form of attachment that is super toxic for us as, as human beings. And I hate these things. I hate computers. I wish, and I told Megan this, like, I wish I could just drop off the grid and hide in the mountains somewhere and not have to worry about this stuff. But it's something that we at least have to be aware of. So that way we know what it's doing to us so we can compensate or cope with whatever that is. Yeah. There's a lot to be said about that. Maybe that <laughs> outside the plant medicine context, but I, yeah. I totally agree with you on these practices of getting rid of your phone. I intentionally leave mine in the car. Like if I'm places, I just leave it. I don't want to have that feeling and you have to retrain it. So if you do it continuously, you know, being without your phone, then you don't get addicted to it. Yeah. So back to the, the plant medicine, the healing stuff, <laughs> yeah. sidetracked on that. But I think it is important, again, talking about the stress response and then leading into these things. But in the silence, you know, I'll challenge people sometimes to just drive in their cars, no radio, don't pick up your phone and just take in the surroundings or just I'll do like random breathwork practices, box breathing and stuff while I'm driving somewhere mm -hmm. or I'll just figure out what's on my mind because a lot of us don't even know what's on our mind because we, we cloud it out. So that to me is a good start, really easy. It can be uncomfortable, but it's, it's an easy first step. I've done combo and I've done bufo. Those are the only two that I have done. And I think that I was not prepared for the bufo the way that I anticipated I would be prepared for the bufo because I fought it so much. I never really practiced too much of like the breathwork side of things. And then I got in it. And I thought I was screwing up the entire ceremony. And I heard the guy and his girlfriend around me walking around as they were like playing sound bowls and stuff. And I'm like, man, this is like, this is hard. Like, this is 10 minutes. I'm probably wasting this. And I come out of it. And I'm like, I, I think I screwed it up, guys. And I was like, what was that, 10 minutes? And he was like, that was like 55 minutes, almost an hour. I'm like, what? And I, I transcend time in that moment. But I was so uneasy with myself that I, I wouldn't allow myself. I, and I know, Bufo, you're kind of fighting the ego side of things. And there was a lot that came from that. But I think that if I would have prepped better and learned a little bit more of the breathwork side of things, that I would have had an even deeper, more spiritual journey while I was under the influence of Bufo. I don't yeah. know if you've seen people have that experience as well. I haven't worked with that medicine. I've just heard. Okay. Yeah. But that is very common with medicines like ayahuasca too. You have to be able to get into a state. The, the way I describe it to people, it's like meditation is where we focus. It's actually a way of controlling the mind. And the way that a lot of these medicines work is actually the opposite. We have to learn to dilate our awareness and sort of let go of the control. So when I was younger, we had these posters. They're called the magic eye. And there was a book. You might be a little younger than me, but if you look at these things, they were sort of computer generated. They just look like nonsense on the page. But if you let your vision focus sort of soften, that all of a sudden it was a 3D image. Yep. I remember those. Yeah. <laughs> so actually the more you tried to see it, you couldn't. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these medicines like ayahuasca, I think Bufo to a certain degree, we have to remember that they're working with like a different way of our consciousness um, expanding, which is the non-controlling consciousness. And it's a lot like that magic eye. We have to kind of soften our control and then it opens up. And then you have all the things that people say. So the other way that I look at it is like the phones, it's, it's a good discussion is that we're not training that part of our mind anymore either. Like when I was in high school, we didn't have phones. And high school is boring. And you sit there and you watch the clock just go tick, tick. And then you find that you're off in daydreams. You're not even there, right? Yep. Until you hear your name called. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, I'm back. Yep. And you weren't paying attention. But we don't do that anymore. I realize we don't allow ourselves to just spin off into daydreams very much. A lot of people don't. I do because I like to sit outside and look at trees and things. But I think a lot of people are losing that aspect of their consciousness and working with the plant medicines can help you reconnect with that because that is sort of how they work. 
But if you haven't practiced that a, a lot and you're not aware that that's what you need to be doing, you can feel like you're wasting your time because it doesn't open up into the things that people talk about that you heard about. And that's the other thing too, is the, the expectations that a lot, like a lot of people will get an expectation that somebody else told them about what they've received on a journey. And so you go in so hyper-focused on, Hey, the, we're going to have the cause, which is going to be the medicine. We're going to get the same effect that Jim had over here. And it's, no, each person has their own journey. And the magic eye thing is perfect because you're focusing like, okay, somebody saw a sailboat. So I know I'm going to see a sailboat and like, oh, well, that was actually the other page. And so you're trying to see the sailboat and it's like, a, I don't know, it's a mushroom. And you're like, what the heck? I don't see the sailboat. And like, well, that, that page wasn't the page, like it wasn't for you. You're on some other journey right now. You're looking at something else. So I think that's important for people to know when they go into that as well as you don't want to compare journeys or experiences that are each specific for you, especially if you do them right. So that way you get what you're supposed to out of your experience. Yeah, it's very hard to let go of expectation because everybody's reading and listening to documentaries and podcasts about plant medicines. And what's fascinating is that, you know, I've been in enough of these ceremonies to know that not everybody has these experiences that you hear about. It's sort of that loud person in the class phenomenon. Yeah. And you just don't hear about it. And yeah. so there is a lot to be aware of. The quiet people that didn't have the big experiences aren't the ones that are out in the world spreading the gospel of these medicines. And actually, I'll give you some anecdotal stuff because ayahuasca in particular doesn't necessarily take people to altered psychedelic states. It's first and foremost a physical purge, a physical medicine. Some aspects of that can involve getting into psychedelic states, but for some people, they're very present the entire time. And that is one of the things that Westerners at first, when they discovered that medicine, they didn't really like about it. It's very unpredictable. See, like now in the psychedelic assisted world, they like predictable medicines. They like a medicine like psilocybin or LSD. MDMA, something where there's a dose that they can give to somebody that has a very predictable response. Right. Bufo, ayahuasca, because DMT is different. It's very unpredictable. You don't know that you're going to take people to the same places. So they're not as suited, the plant medicines, for therapy for that reason. They're more suited, well, I think that in their context, they're beautiful, you know, in the ceremonial context that they came and, and sort of helping us to connect with aspects of consciousness that are very hard to connect with. They can be really amazing, but again, not everyone's going to have those grand experiences and they might feel, uh, did I do something wrong? No, you didn't actually, <laughs> <laughs> not guaranteed. But the interesting thing about ayahuasca, because that's the medicine I have the most experience with, even if people don't have the big experience where they meet the divine or, you know, resolve all their childhood traumas, they usually feel very good after ceremony. Yeah. A lot of that is just the biochemistry of them and that they, they do raise some of the neurotransmitters. I'm not saying that that's uh, the reason enough to go do it, because I think we should be working to raise our neurotransmitters endogenously. But for some people, that, that has seemed to help them snap out of something that was hard to snap out of. If you had to say what your most like, profound ayahuasca experience that you've seen for like somebody else, or even yourself, if you had one, what would you say was your most profound one, the biggest impact that you've seen somebody have, a breakthrough, I guess? I can't even tell you <laughs> there's been so many there's been yeah. so many i've seen people who one of the most common things is that people remember things that they didn't know they had forgotten repressed memories part of that yeah that can go two ways uh, <laughs> if people know if people are prepared and they're working with some sort of therapist to prepare them for the process and they have support it can be really healing i've seen people resolve long time, lifetime traumas from childhood and really get the memories back because our bodies remember, you can tell a lot of times that you've had some trauma just based on like physical reactions, but you may not remember it up here. 
Yeah. And ayahuasca has a remarkable ability to bring repressed memories back into the consciousness. It's like remembering a dream. You know how you, you remember the dream, but then when you're out of it, you're like, I don't remember it. Yeah. And then you, the next, by the end of the day, you forgot altogether what you were dreaming, yeah. but it's in there. And ayahuasca can take people there. I've seen it be incredibly healing. I've seen it also be very destabilizing because people weren't expecting to have that memory. They went in thinking, oh, I need to resolve this issue with my husband. I don't know. Let me, I need some advice. And the entire time they were being shown memories of their childhood. Yeah. And so it's kind of the thing that it, it's incredibly powerful to have those memories come back. I've had memories come back that I just, even to this day, they seem like a dream because repressed memories have this quality to them. That's very, very strange. They're stored deep, deep in the psyche here, you know, those have been very healing. But for me personally, my, my biggest experiences were, I used to be very reductionist. I, I was sort of a skeptic about everything. Yeah. When I started working with the plant medicines, I didn't really have a sort of framework for the divine or God or spirituality. And I think the medicines just put me in another place. <laughs> <laughs> a gentle nudge into the, into the right direction, I guess. Yeah. To the point where it's sort of undeniable for me. I can't imagine thinking otherwise now because it's just shown me the grandeur of the universe. And mm -hmm. there's no way that we can really appreciate how miraculous this universe is. Sometimes we get just caught up in the day to day and we forget, like we're living in an absolute miracle yeah. and medicines will show you that. And then you'll be, you'll be very changed. <laughs> it's like you, you can't unsee it. You can't unlearn can't it. Unsee it's, it. It's there. So ther therapeutically speaking, what would you like to see? We'll just go with ayahuasca. What would you like to see people use that particular plant medicine for? Well, I don't want to be the one to prescribe people what they should and shouldn't do. I think my concerns are based on what I've seen happen with people. Okay. And what I do see is that a lot of people are so stressed, so depleted that the medicines start to take them on a track to where they end up sort of addicted to that process. Okay. To me, a medicine should be something that we go to, it helps us heal and then we don't need it anymore. Yeah. And Quite to the opposite, there's a lot of people entering this world thinking, I'm going to go to one ceremony, and then the next month, they want to go to another ceremony, and then the next month, and it becomes a sort of an addiction. Right. And I would say it's more of a subtle addiction, mm -hmm. because it's an addiction to this healing process. Right. And there is an aspect of serotonin that starts to get dysregulated if you work too much with these medicines and dopamine. Mm -hmm. And I just want people to be aware that there's a lot of belief around them that they're innocuous, they're good for you. And they are for the people of the jungle yeah. because they're in a different state of health and they're in a different state of mind. For us, I've seen them go both ways. And then if you're not supporting yourself with proper diet, nutrition, other things, it can lead down a path that appears that you're healing, but you're really not. <laughs> you're, high, you're just you're addicted to the of, process. Yeah. From one addicted behavior to another one. And you think because it's a plant medicine, like you said, it's innocuous or people think that way. It's like, well, it's, it's better than what I was doing over here. So I'm just going to focus yeah. on this. So I'm glad that I asked that in an improper way as well. And you were able to take it and really, you know, give us a gem in that is, that is, I mean, that's what I see a lot. And, you know, when, when I started doing like my little mini journeys with the combo and the Bufo, like everybody came out of the woodwork and was asking me questions about that. And then I would give just baseline cause I don't, you know, mm -hmm. I don't do ceremonies or anything. And I'd just give basic information that I had on it. And then they're like, Hey, I just did a ceremony. I'm like, Oh, cool. Like, how was it? And they're like, Oh, it was great. And then boom, they're doing another one. Then boom, they're doing another one. And then it's like, certain ones seem like it's a gateway to like, Oh, I did this. Now I want to do that. Now I want to do that. Right. And then they do all of these things, which are overwhelming for the body. And when you talk about the indigenous people who are doing it, 
they don't do it as often as we're doing as what and as far as I know, they don't do it as often and as consistent as as we think that we should do in a westernized culture where we have all of the depletions from our body versus again the indigenous who are a lot better and I didn't know about the gray hair but uh, <laughs> I've got plenty of that too which is why I keep the sides of my hair super short my beard short so. we, we all we all do we all do you know all the traditions of the jungle are different so I don't want to generalize some of yeah. them they start very early and just a part of their life they're doing ceremonies every week with ayahuasca but traditionally it wasn't everybody in the tribes that did it it was yeah. just the, the shamans, the curanderos that did it. Now everybody's doing it, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a little bit different. And I, and I understand the, I've been down that road where you can get addicted to healing and actually it becomes a sort of an addiction to, to pain and it becomes an addiction to the cathartic releases. It becomes an addiction to all of the emotions that are hidden and you start to forget about other things. And I want people to understand that there's benefit in releasing emotion, but there's also benefit in just being happy and, and not feeling like you have to cry every weekend or <laughs> have these yeah. expansive peak experiences. And I think now we've seen enough of it, at least in my communities, that we've seen people that are coming out of it after years of realizing that they were just in a downward spiral with it. Yeah. That if you're in it that long and you're that consistent, well, if it healed you, then you should be out of it. <laughs> What's Why going are you on? still doing it? <laughs> Why are you still doing it? And it actually is destabilizing to the psyche. Yeah. It becomes a sort of weird addiction. And so that's one of the things that isn't spoken about because most of the people running ceremonies are zealous advocates. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you all of the great things and everything and, and you should be there every month and, you know, they're, they're salespeople. Yep. I'm not, I want people to be vibrant and healthy and not have a reliance on a medicine to make you that way. The other thing that's happening is I think we're moving away from a lot of that and people are getting really into microdosing things as sort of a, a way to continue the feelings comes, you know, on a longer term basis. And I, I'm sort of mixed on that right now because I don't know the long-term effects. And to me, my philosophy is like, you shouldn't need that. <laughs> we, can, yeah. we can fix that. <laughs> we can get yep. your neurotransmitters working, then you don't need a microdose. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm much more of a natural, I, I, I believe our bodies can heal. Our emotions can heal and we have to support them and kind of get out of the way a little bit. It doesn't always require these big, big, you know, things, these, these, these plant ceremonies. Experience. Yeah. yeah. Cause I feel like sometimes it's, it's a distraction from the present where a lot of people don't, like we talked about, we don't know how to just be in the moment. And so when they're sitting in the moment, sometimes that discomfort comes and they're like, oh, you know what I need to do? I need to schedule my next ceremony. And then, so you just hyper-focus on that next ceremony. And even though you, you may have you know, receive what you needed to from the previous, if you don't sit in that state of gratitude for where you are and who you are right now, you're constantly going to be distracted. And I see that with some of the people that I, that I know and associate with it just, it does it becomes like this addictive distraction from where they currently are. And yeah, I, I'm with you where one of my biggest pet peeves is people getting stuck on medicine or on supplements for the rest of their life and i'm like well if you fixed the cause then why do you still need that supplements are just designed to supplement your current lifestyle just like plant medicines it's designed to supplement your current state and then help you to be able to go to the the next level of your state if you so choose so the micro dosing i was going to ask you what your opinion was on that because i know a lot of people who do that and i'm not big on that i i, I did uh, mushrooms by accident when I was in college and it was not a good experience. I understand microdosing is less than that, but I freaked out watching, uh, the new Alice in Wonderland and the whole TV screen became 3d and my computer melted in my lap. Like it wasn't enjoyable for me at all, but, uh, 
but yeah. when, but when we're talking about the the microdosing aspect, I know that there's a lot of I don't even think they're like licensed practitioners. I don't think they know that much about it. They just got their hands on some sort of microdose, either capsules or tinctures, and they're like, just take this. And I'm like, well, the same thing. They're treating everybody the same with same doses, and it's. I don't know. I see it becoming a problem long term, five, five years, 10 years from now. I see people having new diseases and new disorders caused from this constant usage of these things. Have you ever thought of anything like that? Oh, yeah. I think about that all the time. <laughs> One of the things that I, I've been trying to understand and I have yet to find it is really just a breakdown of mineral content and nutrients in a lot of these plants it's kind of wrapped in a mystery. So the fungus, we don't know. It's a, we should be able to know what minerals are in the fungus. I, I wish that somebody's doing that work, but they're not. Yeah. I do have research that I found about psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in mushrooms. And it does talk about how it depletes magnesium and calcium because they're sort of interdependent with each other. Yeah. And my intuition is that if people feel the need to do it, they're usually doing it for two reasons. One is they're depressed and this is sort of keeping them in some sort of baseline. And the solution to me would be to really work on the, the underlying metabolic issues that are at play here, get their minerals up so that they can make their natural dopamine. They can make their natural neurotransmitters. And the other reason I see is more like people that feel it expands their consciousness. Maybe they're thinking that it's helping their creativity and it's helping them to think in different ways and this and that. But that again, there's an issue going on here <laughs> that we're failing to acknowledge because I believe our minds are meant to be imaginative, creative, intuitive. We're, we're meant to see the connections, but we're getting stuck. A lot of people are getting stuck. And so I would be more interested in seeing people that feel they need to do it for this creative reason uh, to try to figure out, well, what's blocking their creativity and get those blockages out of the way. So I, I don't know the answer on safety and long-term use, and I don't think anybody does. And I think that's one of the things that is sort of giving it free reign. You know, I could imagine that when certain things came out onto the marketplace, it happens still. We don't have a lot of safety data <laughs> and people just think it's fine <laughs> because there's no data. <laughs> yeah. And I'm it like, be bad, right? There's no data to say that it's bad. So it must not be bad. <laughs> and that's what I'm like, wait, I don't think that way. I want to, I want to know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm very cautious. I don't, I don't take Advil, you know, but like yeah. people taking things willy nilly. I'm like, well, see, I'm very cautious about what I put in my body. I want to make sure it's not going to destabilize me. Cause one thing that I've learned is that our bodies have a very delicate balance. Mm -hmm. I think people don't realize how delicate the balance is mm -hmm. and they're taking this supplement and they're taking these herbs and they're doing all this. And it's like, each one is probably throwing it in a different direction and the body's like very good at trying to find homeostasis, but it's so confused. And so I'm, I'm a little bit conservative in my approach to what I put in my body. Yeah. But microdosing is a huge thing that's happening. And I think with the legalization of certain medicines coming, there's a feeling that that will be a huge market. Okay. You think and they'll that, do the research then or just wait until there's enough you side are the effects of the case? <laughs> <laughs> We're the phase three clinical trial. What's going to happen? I don't know. Figure it out. We'll track it. I've also started to really suspect trials because I, I don't think you can control for all the variables. And I don't know that these are the kinds of medicines that could be easily tested yeah. because it's long term. It's sort of like the studies with diet. You know, it's very hard to use this. I mean, we know based on human history, but it's very hard in like a controlled one year period to determine what the long term effects are. Even then, if they, they, there are studies that come out, I, I would be a little bit cautious because we still we're dealing with effects that are hard to identify. I think people are think to quantify, yeah, hard to quantify. And, and usually the the things that people are looking for 
You know, it, it may be something else that happens and they just don't spot it. So I, I think a lot of it is coming. There's going to be, if psilocybin is legalized more and more, which it's sort of being pushed for legalization in the therapeutic setting, mm -hmm. I think there will be a, a big market for, for this kind of thing. So I, I'm not going to be one to stop it. I just want people to understand like, Hey, you know, there's, there's other ways to, to approach this, or if you are going to do it, understand that you probably need to be doing other things to to keep your minerals up because we do know at least now they burn through magnesium and everyone's already burning their magnesium so there's some some things to be aware of yeah there's um there's a website i don't know if you know about this one or not it's called mitavin m-y-d-a-v-i-n.com it's awesome you'll love okay. it it's you type in a medication and it'll tell you what minerals that medication depletes Cool. Might have been. I need that one. I'm gonna yeah, have to. Yeah, I'll I'll send you right. a message with it. But I've used it in the past because like what I'll see a lot of times is like people be like, Hey, Jacques, I'm coming to you. I'm so tired. I'm so fatigued. And like I've gotten good enough to know that like if you're on a blood pressure medication, number one side effect is fatigue because it slows down your heart to stop your high blood pressure. So like they want me to treat a symptom caused by a medication and I'm not legally allowed to tell you to get on or off of one, but I can say, you know, if this was me, like you want me to fix this. It's going to be very difficult for me to make a change in this if you're still on it. So same thing, like if somebody's going to go do plant medicine and they're on a bunch of medications and I know like SSRIs in particular, they, they burn through everything in your body, yeah. B6, like it just, and it slaughters the whole hormonal production. Plus, it tends to make people more estrogen dominant, cause an increase in aromatase activity from testosterone to estrogen. So we have all of this stuff that's just standard for Western medicine. Everyone's on something. And we don't understand what that's doing if we don't have the side effect that's written on a pamphlet. And then to me, like when there's a medicine, first off, original medicine or old medicine or plant, like this was around so long before modern medicine was around. There's a whole bunch of information, which you probably know about Rockefeller and how he got his hands on this, turned into pharmaceuticals and petrol. It's disgusting yep. when you think about all of that, but people are like, oh, well, I trust modern medicine. Like It was derived from something natural. Why would you not do the natural? And then if you think about the medication, I like to think about how that medication is supposed to hijack my body chemistry. And usually the side effects will tell you what happens or what areas are sacrificed due to that medication. Mm -hmm. But we have some of that data and the trial piece of it, <laughs> I, I completely agree that even if you do the, the placebo control group, experimental group, and you run your, the, the actual scientific method and allow there to be questioned about your hypothesis when you run it, I forget who I was listening to. There's a, a podcast where this, this doctor is talking about peer-reviewed studies and things, and they basically publish whatever the heck they want to publish about whatever it is that they're promoting. So even if they do the study, can you even trust the study on this stuff? Yeah. The, the, people are so fast to consume, it blows my mind. Yeah. The peer-reviewed process has become an information laundering system for the big pharmaceutical companies, largely. Yeah. And it's fascinating to see that play out because anything that goes against sort of big narratives, won't, it won't get published. So it's not a fair system. And I, I like the term information laundering because it perfectly describes what's happening. That's, that's <laughs> just yeah, make sure that's a beautiful that, way to put it. Yeah. I think I got that from Robert F. Kennedy, but it's a phenomenon. Yeah, it's yeah. a phenomenon that makes me a little bit, I, I do read study. I read a lot of studies. I was reading one on serotonin today, right before this call and the methodologies and it's, it, there's, there's sort of issues because in theory, a study should be replicable mm -hmm. by someone else doing it, but they're almost never replicable because there's so many biases baked in. Yep. You know, they'd have to also replicate the, the math tricks and everything, which, you know, yeah. you can't, you can't yeah. really account for that. Yeah. <laughs> oh so, my gosh. so I, I, I'm a little bit, you know, when it comes to plant medicines too, when they start to get legal, I get a little bit sort of on edge because I know that the powers that be, which are the big pharmaceutical companies are very powerful in their reach. And this is not 
a conspiracy. It's just the fact that they are very good at controlling narratives and media and policies. So if plant medicines are starting to become legal, which a lot of them are, psilocybin, MDMA, ketamine is already fairly legal in certain respects. It's not a plant medicine, but it's more of a psychedelic. I start to think, well, the big pharmaceutical companies want that to happen mm -hmm. because they could easily call their friends in government and shut it down. <laughs> and they're not. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I and I've looked at enough studies to know that there's a long history of psychedelic research in our country, going back to the 50s and 60s when a lot of these medicines were legal, and they were being studied by our government and on our soldiers, and they know the effects. The effects are are not always good, <laughs> and then somebody ends up. On another medicine later, they make more money off of them. Yeah. So I, I start to just tell people like everyone's very excited about legalization and this. I'm like, well, if they're making it legal, you might want to ask yourself why, because usually it's not for our best interests. I'm not really a kind of person that believes that drugs should be illegal. I think people should have sovereignty over their consciousness in a safe way. But I think we lack the ability sometimes to realize that there's consequences. And so I, you know, just looking at alcohol as an example, which it it's very legal, it alters our consciousness, but it's also very detrimental. Yeah. So I'm, I'm all for everybody being able to drink, but just be aware, like you are hurting yourself. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's not rocket do, science. <laughs> do, it, do it with open eyes. Yeah, and, and I think that's what's happening a little bit with the plant medicine world is sort of this kind of rose colored glasses, like, oh, it's great. Yeah, well, maybe. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I, don't I agree the same way Like, take cannabis, for example, when cannabis got legalized in, I think, almost every state. Now, I, don't, I don't know how many. I know in Arizona, it's legal, but that concerned me. I'm like, well, then there's going to be government regulations and sanctions on how this stuff is supposed to be made. And to me, I'm like, as soon as governments or pharmaceuticals get their hand in anything that was natural, to me, yeah, I, feel I feel as though it's going to be tampered with. And just like if you're going to legalize psilocybin or something, is that a clinical trial? Are we consuming and then allowing for pharmaceutical to gather that information to then make a synthetic form of whatever it is. And then they're able to capitalize on that. You know, like, that's how my brain works. I can't help it. <laughs> yeah, I was actually talking to somebody that I know who's in the cannabis business here recently, uh, last week. And he's basically telling me that because of what's happened with legalization, there's no good cannabis available anyway. <laughs> it's all filled with chemicals and growth factors and pesticides yeah. and things. And He's like, I wouldn't use it. <laughs> He's <Yeah>. in business. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. It's it's sad that it's come to that. And if you think, you know, growth is a competition. So if you can produce the the biggest, largest, you're gonna throw some miracle grow on there, you're gonna throw some pesticide on there to make sure the plants stay stay alive, and then that's gonna get spliced into the DNA of the the plants, and then you're gonna be consuming that, just like genetically modified foods or you know, glyphosate and and those types of things that we consume in our food sources, or hopefully you don't consume in your food sources. It's sad yeah, to say yeah. the least. So that's one of the reasons why it's one of the main reasons I, I appreciate you sharing this information on like the risks associated with these things. And then the mineral aspect of this, because then it's going to quite honestly, it's going to make my job easier because then there's going to be less sick people out there that we have to worry about trying to take care of. And the more we know, and the more we understand about what we put into our bodies, you know, we need to become our own doctors. And, you know, we say, let food be that medicine. Well, plants, is, it's a part of that. So you have to know the impact and the, the, the effects that it's going to have on your body to properly serve your body, but make sure that you don't deplete neurotransmitters or nutrients or something else or cause a, a hormonal cascade or who knows what other plethora of things to go wrong. So I really appreciate you sharing this information. Yeah, absolutely. Where can people follow you and, and look? Because I know you've been posting a ton of content on it. I don't remember what the handle is. I just see it and I like it all the time. 
Yeah, it's Mineral Shaman on Instagram. Awesome. Okay. Mineral Shaman, and uh, the website is mineralshaman.com. And that's where I'm sort of feeding all of my work around minerals, plant medicines, health coaching, the work that I do consulting with people, not as a doctor, but as a guide and helping them on their journeys. And uh, so, yeah, that's a good way if you want to tap into these conversations. I love it. Thanks so much, man. I really appreciate you being on. I know we talked for, for quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I think That's great. Yeah, I think it's super valuable information. And I'm excited because I know from the community that I've built, there's been a lot of questions because like they'll see that I, I have my my combo marks on my <laughs> on my shoulder and people are like, what the heck is that? And so it opens the conversation to these things. And I'm not an expert at all in this stuff. I am super curious about it and how these things kind of coincide. And to be honest, my envision is to have like a retreat set up that people can heal their adrenals. They can heal their guts. We have, we saturate you full of nutrients. And then if you're ready and, and if you pass like the test, quite literally, you can do a micronutrient test if you want to, if you're calibrated, then if you want to step into the plant medicine realm, you have the green light, as long as you know how to supplement it through that. And I think that would be a great retreat idea. I don't know. And maybe I, I can that. have you educate all those people. <laughs> I love it. That's so yeah. good. Because <laughs> Meg and I, we want to buy land in, in Sedona or around Sedona or something. I'm like, I'd love to just do like a bunch of little tiny homes with a giant like uh, collective bonfire around the center and just invite all my patients to come out and then go on this healing journey with us and do it the right freaking way so that they don't get scared from it. Because that's the other thing. If you try to go towards the natural and you don't do it right, or you have a horrible experience, how else then are you going to heal your body? You're usually going to go towards medicine again, which is going to damage your body to begin with. So I'm all about best first experiences, doing it right, educate yourself as much as humanly possible, and then find you everywhere that you are. <laughs> just <laughs> consume as much information as possible. And I feel like I want to take you out for lunch or something just to pick your brain more on this stuff because it, I mean, this is probably one of the most insightful podcasts I've done. So again, I really appreciate you being honest. I'm so excited yeah. to, to release this to people. So thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me.